Every week, Hillsdale College President Larry P. R. joins Hugh Hewitt to discuss great books, great men, and great ideas. This is the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Also at the Hillsdale College Podcast Network, check out the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, the Hillsdale College K-12 Classical Education Podcast, the Larry P. Arn Show, and more, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway, joined by Dr. Larry Arn, because it's time for the Hillsdale Dialogue, the last radio hour of the week. Dr. Arn, of course, up in Michigan at hillsdale.edu. Good morning, Dr. Arn. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I just did a uh, recording for a new Hillsdale video course by Victor Davis Hanson. And so I'm curious, have you ever seen Victor laugh? I mean, really, belly laugh. Ever seen it? Yeah. How do you get him to laugh? I've known him for 25 years. I've never gotten him to laugh. He really is a farmer farmer. Well, he's a he's a happy man, but uh, he doesn't evince it all the time. Uh, yeah, well, no, he's right. very happy. Sure, he laughs. Yeah, uh, just... Victor has some friends, and uh, I've seen him laugh often among them. I'm one of them, but you know, there's a and he, he uh, Victor is uh, my favorite Greek word, skudaios. Victor is a serious man. Yes, and, he uh, is. That means that he's, you know, and so he's, he takes things seriously. But he's, you know, he's got, you know, if you think about the range of things in his life, he's a farmer. Uh, he lives where his family's lived for five generations. He's loyal. He's built a magnificent career in uh classics. It's unprecedented, by the way. He's lately Stanford, where he's employed, not really as a regular faculty member because they don't like him. He's at Hoover, but uh, when the classics department at Stanford sums up who gets most cited among the historic, among the classicists, Victor, I think, if I remember the list right, was third on the list in the entire world. And so they count his name for that. Makes him look yeah. good. You know, VDH, I, I like to quote E.M. Forster with regards to him. E.M. Forster said, you know you are being influenced when you read something and say to yourself, I might have written that had I had more time. Now, I don't, don't think I could ever write like VDH writes because that man is smart. But he is very influential. He moves people by his writing. And I assume that this course is going to be among the most popular ever at Hillsdale.edu. We don't know the numbers yet, but that's going to be Do you know whatever is the Churchill course number one in all the courses at, at Hillsdale.edu? No. No. Well, there's a lot of them now. There's about 40 of them, and uh, they're growing. I think last year we had one million people sign up anew. And the most popular ones in groups are anything to do with co- the Constitution, Anything to do with Christianity, theology, those are those those sort of tend to bunch up toward the top of the rankings. But I am looking forward. I'm going to watch VDH on citizenship. I just think it'll be fascinating. All right, next week we're going to come back to World War One and Churchill. And we're going to get into Volume Three, I believe. But let me begin with news of the week. Once in a while, we break off from World War One and our march through that that disastrous five years. Uh, the year before in the four years of the war, to talk about what's going on. I can't believe I'm going to ask you about this, because it was a story a week ago Saturday when Donald Trump went to Ohio and declared this, cut number seven. Mexico has taken over a period of 30 years, 34 percent of the automobile manufacturing business in our country. Think of it. Went to Mexico. China now is building a couple of massive plants where they're going to build the cars in Mexico and think, they think, that they're going to sell those cars into the United States with no tax at the border. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, 
And you think you're going to get that? You're going to not hire Americans and you're going to sell the cars to us now? We're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. Now, that's the full quote. Here's the short version, which many people heard on media in the past week. Cut number six. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath. So, Dr. Arn, if a student quoted Donald Trump as saying there was going to be a bloodbath and did not include the context, how would you grade that? <laughs> well, that's an F. It, it, uh, I mean, yes. it is amazing to me, by the way. It, uh, it's the plainest thing in the world. It's the same thing as Charlottesville uh, last year, a year, two years ago. He, he didn't say that neo-Nazis are fine people. He said that there were fine people on both of the sides that wanted the statue gone and both sides that wanted it to stay. It was actually a peace statement. And this is uh, a bloodbath for the automobile industry. Yes. And that's what he's talking about, right? And and uh, so, you know, it, it's uh, sometimes I wonder, you know, Hillsdale College gets covered in the press more than it wishes. And uh, I wonder about the people sometimes. It. You know what? What? How? What, how do they conceive their careers? What do they think they're doing? You know, because do they think it's that now the truth is known that we have to radicalize the society, that they have to be agents in that, that that's their calling in life, which they pursue with the zeal of Florence Nightingale looking after troops in the Crimea? Is that what they think? Because it's. An amazing hubris, for one thing. What about just have the argument? You know, the, the, uh, there's a good argument to be had about that speech by Trump, and that is, is it a good idea to put 100% tariffs on cars made in Mexico coming into the United States? Is that a good idea? That's a real question in economics. And American people would do well to think about that. And uh, I think I know what they think. And I think Trump thinks he knows what he thinks, but they should think. And that is the point raised by his statement. Now, by the way, if there's a plan to allow that, you know, in the Biden administration, if they've got assurances that they can bring those cars in, well, that's something that ought to be known. Yeah, see, I, I have no idea. On the come. I have no idea how we treat car imports from Mexico. I know what the former president was calling for was a 100% tariff on Chinese subsidized electric vehicles being made in Mexico. That might be a great idea for national security reasons, which is we do not want them to dominate the EV market. It might be a terrible idea for economic reasons. I tend to be a free trader in the Reagan mold, but tariffs have long been, I believe Lincoln was a tariff man. I know Hamilton was a tariff man. The tariff debate, McKinley won and realigned politics in the United States on the tariff in 1896. We go back and forth on this, Dr. And I, I, I don't know where you are on this. I tend to be free trade, but China isn't about free trade. That's about national security. Am I correct? Or where does Larry Arn come down on tariffs? I've worked that out down to <clears throat> uh, Churchill was mostly a free trader. Lincoln was a protectionist. The natural law does not speak to me on this issue. <laughs> uh, <all right. laughs> you see, you I'll got me to laugh. To help with thinking about it. That might get it's, Victor uh, Davis yeah, Hanson to laugh, Victor's actually. If on the phone, he'd be laughing. <laughs> uh, if, uh, here, here's another way to put it. A fundamental principle of economics is that division of labor is efficient, you know, if we all had to grow our own tom tomatoes and make our own shoes, that wouldn't be very efficient. So if a division of labor is good and trade is good because it's more efficient for both parties in the trade or else the trade is not made, then in principle, global across the world, division of labor is good. And so that, that argument is true and dispositive as far as it goes. 
But then you have to add in another factor, and that is countries are not all the same. And and the bearing of that, that it's very important, is obvious. Uh, I'm told that we have a budget to make uh, three submarines a year, and I'm told that China gives us parts for one and a half. That's exactly that right. Good? That's terrible. And we come back, we're going to continue to talk about this and whatever else the natural law does not speak to. Otherwise, it's unsettled. I'll be right back with Dr. Larry on the Hillsdale Dialogue rolls along all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu. Hey, it's Scott Bertram, and I've got a challenge for you today. Become a better educated American citizen. And to help you do just that, we at Hillsdale College have our free online courses available for all who wish to learn. Our challenge? Take just one of our courses. There are so many to choose from. You can discover the beauty of the Bible in the Genesis story, study the writings of C.S. Lewis, or explore the true meaning of America in Constitution 101. We have dozens more to choose from, and all these self-paced free courses feature Hillsdale faculty and scholars, many you've heard on this podcast. So visit hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E, and pick one of the more than 30 free Hillsdale courses. I hope you'll accept my challenge. Pick whichever course you like and become a more educated citizen today. Go to hillsdale.edu slash course, C-O-U-R-S-E. That's hillsdale.edu slash course. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Dr. Lorian and I, every three weeks or so, diverge from Churchill or issues of great consequence in the Hillsdale Dialogue and talk about what's going on in the world. Hillsdale does not take political positions. I'm going to find out how they do radio when I go up there next month, and I broadcast from the Hillsdale studios for a couple of days, thanks to Scott. If he's got White Sox stuff in there, Dr. Arn, do I get to sue the university? Because he's a White Sox fan, and I do not trust him. Yeah, you know, there's no excuse for that. Uh, All right. If he weren't such an excellent employee in other respects, I would fire him. Okay, let's just make sure that they've I got mean, Guardian all, stuff. Is it even good taste? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, C- Cubs fans are like martyrs, right? But uh, what is the White Sox anyway? It is. It exactly. It's, it's only a scandal-ridden organization that can't win because they're badly run. Let me turn to Rafa. Until a month ago. It is my guess that less than one-tenth of one percent of Americans knew where Rafa was. But earlier this week, the President of the United States called our ally, Benjamin Netanyahu, and told him he could not go into Rafa because the civilian casualties would be too high. I'm going to come back to this next segment, but I'm going to get there by an unusual, circuitous route, as is my want. Have you watched Masters of the Air yet? The new Apple Plus TV yes. series. Yes. What do you think of it? It's beautiful. It's uh, a great achievement. It uh, it rivals Band of Brothers and those other ones, right? It may be better. It's very good. I watched it mostly because I started because my uncle did his quota minus one of missions in the in the bomber in the Flying Fortress over Europe. My other uncle flew over the hump. My dad was floating around in the Pacific. You know what is mentioned not very much at all in that are the civilian casualties, which I believe in Germany totaled in excess of three million Germans. And I know a lot of Great Britons died both in the Blitz and in the V2s. And I'm sure Penny has an opinion on this. Did did we care about civilian casualties in World War Two? Oh, yeah. Well, there's some talk of it in the series. Uh, the uh, the pilots are reluctant to bomb center of a German town once uh, and a church nearby they wanted to preserve. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the bombing was very important. One of the strategic things that comes out of that series is that uh, they, they felt like they had to get rid of all the German airplanes, fighters and bombers. And so part of the reason that they were doing those bombing runs was to get their fighters up in the air and their so they could kill them, and uh, the bombers were bait, and they knew that. And they're in the first year of the war, the casualty rates were 
it, you know, they were 80% in the hundreds. The, the little, uh, little, it's an hour and a bit long documentary called the, the, the bloody hundreds that Tom Hanks and Steve Spielberg did. The, you can watch that right after you watch masters of the air and it is excellent. And it's interviews with some of the guys who were still alive at the time. I think they're all gone now. Do you know, Dr. Uh, Ron, your, your and, father-in-law uh, yeah, was at were, Dunkirk, right? I don't know how often he talked about it. My Uncle Jim never once mentioned. I saw Uncle Jim, you know, once a month for 20 years, and he never once mentioned his 29 out of 30 missions. They didn't make him fly the last one because their captain got reassigned. Did, did your did your father-in-law talk much about Dunkirk? Well, there's a, there's a story about that. Uh, I, I'm the one who got him to talk about the war. I was warned when I went up to meet him, driving up from Oxford to north of Preston, where Penny grew up. And, you know, Daddy doesn't like talking about the war, she said to me, more than once. And I I go in, and he said, uh, would you like a drink, young man? It was just after dinner. And uh, I said, sure. And he said, what do you do? And I said, well, I work for Martin Gilbert. And he said, what do you do for him? And I said, I do research. And he said, uh, uh, what are you researching? And I said, uh, Winston Churchill. He said, of course. He said, but what part? And I said, well, this week we're working on Dunkirk Beach. <laughs> this was true. And he said, I was there. And then we talked about it for two hours. Well, there you go. And uh, the key, the key was he didn't want to talk about himself. He, he loved to talk about the war. He just See, didn't know very many people knew anything If about anyone it. has a World War II veteran or a Vietnam veteran in their life, follow that advice. Get them to talk not about themselves, but about their band of brothers. And they will talk. I'll be right back with Dr. Larry Arn. We'll talk about Rafa after this. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Jake Sullivan uh, added to this week's Hillsdale Dialogue with Dr. Larry Arn a little bit of information for my audience. Uh, the Monday appearance of Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, in the White House press room. Dr. Arn, what he said was that A, Israel shouldn't meddle in our politics and we shouldn't meddle in their politics, and B, there are alternatives to going into Rafa on the ground. Now, I asked Brett Baer on Tuesday, uh, he was a Pentagon reporter, has the United States ever dictated how to fight a war to an ally? And the answer that in Brett's experience is no. What do you make of this? Jawboning Israel not to kill Hamas in Rafa? Well, you know, you watch that Masters of the Air, and one of the heroes is a man named Rosie Rosenthal. And uh, he was he he completed the most missions of any American bomber pilot, and the odds of completing that many or even the minimum number were low, right? He's a hero, and he was a Jew. And he, he tells his story. He says, I wanted to do something, and I felt helpless. My whole race was being exterminated, right? So, first of all, is, is modern Israel itself is the answer to the question, what do Jews do about the fact that they are badly treated for millennia all over the world? And the answer is, get your own place. I remember when, uh, in, the, in the Gulf War, when they were firing, uh, when Iran was firing those Scud missiles into Israel, and Israel was encouraged not to reply, and they didn't. And I remember Den Benjamin Netanyahu on TV saying, he was prime minister then too, he said, our rule is we always reply. We are not to be led anymore to the gas chambers by ourselves. And the point is they restrained themselves over that in the interest of our coalition war effort. And I think we ought to be grateful to them. But now this is a matter that concerns mainly themselves, right? And what is Hamas? You know, there's a lot of argument about Islam today. But Islam is uh, the radical, crazy parts of it, which I think most of it are not. It is infused with the toxic Western ideology 
the Gestapo helped to found some of those political parties back there and the communist others, right? And so what are these guys? They're a bunch of racist, utopian, crazy guys who want to cleanse the earth of certain peoples. Well, they've attacked and they've killed a bunch of babies and their parents, most many of whom were at a dance when they, when they came across. And so they figure out that they gave up Gaza, you know, encouraged by us to do it. And then and, uh, Hamas won the election. And so after the election, of course, Hamas murdered all the Fatah people. They took over all of the uh, Gaza, and they spent 17 years building 300 miles of underground. Dr. Arndt, do we have anything to say to the Israelis about what they, I mean, they have to destroy that underground. They can't lead 10,000 armed Hamas fighters in the underground. Yeah, that's right. And uh, here's a point, too. They are being effective. I think I talked about it last time we were on, but apparently they have, you know, as of two weeks ago, they have lost 350 soldiers clearing those tunnels. And they're doing a massively good job with with collateral damage. And they're trying to, right? Whereas, remember, the difference here is the Israeli army, which is accountable to a freely elected government, is taking care not to kill innocent people. It does kill some. It's war. But they're taking care not to do it. Whereas Hamas specifically targeted even babies, for goodness sake, and are holding hostages under difficult conditions as bargaining chips, it is a barbarous way to fight. And that's how they fight. And they've got these entrenchments that they have dug for however long they've been there, and, they're, and they're, it's, it, it's meant to be dug in as a base from which to destroy an entire people. Right? Now, we have talked in the weeks before about World War I and how the defense is always preferable to the attack. That has gone up by a factor, I don't know how much, when you've got a tunnel complex 17 years in the making with hidey holes that you can pop out of. The only thing I can remember close to it in Vietnam are stories of the, of the tunnels that the Viet Cong had, had created that were a, always a menace to American troops. I don't think World War One had tunneling in it, I believe, but I don't think World War Two did, did it? Uh, oh yeah, sure it did. But see, not as much, right? Because World War One was a great, you know, for, if, the middle three years of World War One were a huge, more or less static battle, and that meant that you know you knew where they were, and there'd be these assaults, and they'd lose half a million dead on one side or the other or both, and then it would move it very little. And then they just immediately dig more tunnels, and, you know, once you're tr trenches, and then once you're trenching, you can go underground, too, and, you know, try to get behind them. And it was, you know, it was a hideous war. Three-fifths of World War One were massive firepower, with troops cowering behind it in protected positions, and then once in a while sallying out to get killed. And we're, we're going to return to that next week, but I do want to focus for one, one more second on Chuck Schumer last week, Dr. Arn, standing in the Senate, calling on Israel to hold new elections. I have, I, I'm 68. I, we've never done that. No one has ever done that to a Democratic ally. Uh, we've done yeah. it to dictatorships. Reagan called on uh, Gorbachev to tear down the wall, Benjamin Netanyahu won an election last year. There will be another election within four years. That's the law. What did you make of that? Yeah. It, uh, you know, when they're under mortal threat. But, you know, it, it is... Uh, we, we, you and I have complained about the press today. But here's another thing about them. It's uh, cynically said, and perhaps true, that Joe Biden has got to win Michigan. And he's not doing well in Michigan right now, but there's a bunch of Arab voters in Michigan. So he holds the view, it's said, that he, that he needs to be tough on Israel to get reelected. But, you know, their lives are at stake, right? And what about that? That's a, it's a, our politics are in 
so many ways craven now and beneath the dignity of a free country, which raises the fear that it won't be a free country. Yeah, and uh, when we come back from break, I'm just going to point out that Joe Biden in 2020 received the votes of 68 percent of Jewish Americans, down from Al Gore's 79 percent in 2000. It's been a steady decline. I believe that Donald Trump will do even better among Jewish American voters who care first about Israel and about friends of Israel who are not necessarily Jewish like me and you who are are just appalled by this. I'll be right back with Dr. Arn to finish off our week looking back. Don't go anywhere, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Hey there. Today, I want to tell you about the Hillsdale K-12 Classical Education Podcast. This unique show explains how children benefit from an American classical education. Whether you're a teacher, student, or parent, you'll find something of value on the show. You'll hear from teachers and administrators from schools around the country, as well as Hillsdale professors and friends who are leading the effort to revive the American tradition of K-12 education. When you listen, you'll learn all about classical education, what it is, how to teach it, and why it matters today. And there are dozens of back episodes on specific topics, like teaching Singapore math, reading great books, and even understanding how athletics is critical to a child's development. Listen every Monday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. Welcome back, America. The Hillsdale Dialogue will return to World War I next week. But I, I do throw in every now and then a week with Dr. Arn where we talk about what's going on in the news. Hillsdale College, all things Hillsdale at hillsdale.edu including the application for Hillsdale. Dr. Arn, I had to give you a chance to comment on the, the Washington Post story or New York Times story this week that the SATs are back and they're causing panic among high school students. Now, I think that's kind of a stupid reaction to a standardized test, but I do believe in standardized tests. Does Hillsdale make it optional? Do you have to take the ACT or the SAT? And what do you make about the reintroduction? Because it turns out universities can't find people to succeed, and the people who skip the test do, do worse in the two years that they skip the test. It's all very empirical. Yeah, we have a study about that now. Uh, we made it optional for, uh, during the COVID because it was hard to take it. And uh, so we have some students who didn't take it, and we can compare them to the ones who did. And uh, in our case, they're just the same. Now, it's a minority. It, it, well, that's uh, unusual. It, well, it's, maybe it is. You know, first of all, it's a small test, right? A small sample, as we say. But, um, it, you know, and, and there are special circumstances here, right? You, if you yeah, come to Hillsdale selection. College, That's quite yeah, a I, high bit of praise for Hillsdale, that your students who choose not to take the test do as well as those who do, because in the other universities, in the control groups, that did not turn out to be the case. So that's a yeah. self-selection issue. Yeah, and, you know, if you come here, you're informed that it's very difficult and, you know, and you won't do as well here. You won't get as high grades here as you get. We don't, our grades are lower. Uh, they're higher than they used to be because kids are really smart now. It is very hard to get in here. Uh, and the test is a, is a good indicator, right? And, you know, think of what the problem is, right? If you're running a college, you should be in the success business. You should want it to go well. You want the kids to succeed. And, and because the, the, the activity of a college, almost nobody knows what a college actually is anymore. But it's called college because it's a bunch of people learning together. And that means they all help each other, right? And so you've got to, you've got to get a bunch of people together who are prepared to address a curriculum that the college defines. All colleges define some kind of curriculum. We have a big core curriculum, same for everybody, that kind of thing. And that's crucial, we think. But that means you, you, you agree in advance you're going to study a lot of stuff that you might not choose to study, choosing for yourself. And so then you, and, and then you control it. it People think, you know, you have a right on a college to say whatever you want, uh, up to a limit you do. The limit is you have to be academic and civil in your comments. But, but you know, if you're going to have to, you know, study history and physics and chemistry and biology and all of them, theology and 
politics and economics, right? It doesn't, it, you know, we are controlling, by, they volunteer for us to control their mental weather for four years, right? Yeah. And they have to sign up to do that. And it, we've learned from experience, we've learned it's no good having kids who would really rather not be here. Yeah, you know, I, I, I got to read you from this Washington Post story. MIT, Georgetown, and the University of Florida are among the schools which quickly chose to reinstate the SAT requirements, or ACT, with MIT announcing the change in 2022. At Brown, Yale, and Dartmouth, officials said they found something surprising. Considering test scores would help them identify more promising applicants from disadvantaged backgrounds, not fewer. You know, it, it, to me, it's always been, tell me who is doing well with limited resources, and I'll tell you who will succeed at college. And I think the SAT and the ACT helps you do that, along with the financial aid application. I'm curious, I've never asked you, what is your position on legacy admissions, Dr. Arn? Because I've always thought they ought to be a factor. Yeah, well, we, we so yeah, we take that into account. Um, uh, here's, here's a way. It, it turns out that when you're 18 years old uh, and you're about to go to college, it's an ordeal of a kind, I mean, it's a delightful ordeal, but it's an ordeal, don't mistake it, of a kind you've never met before. So you have to predict how they will do. Well, if they've got an older sibling who was great, isn't that something? You know, yep. that helps. You know, we've had 500 kids here, it seems like, named Viviano. Huh. They're, they're, they're all the same, you know. I mean, they're all different, of course, but they, are, they show up to work. They, you know, they, they actually, I, I met one the other day who's an alum, and I was somewhere, and she came up to me with her husband and her 14 kids, and I said, God, we're going to be a bunch more of you guys now. Said, they're all born to it, you know. And there's, you know. That is, it's, that, it's a complicated process, but in the bottom line, it's all about effort. It really is all about effort. Dr. Larry Arnn, thank you. Hillsdale.edu for that application, which is not really an ordeal. It's kind of fun, actually, if you make it a game and you make it fun. Hillsdale.edu. It's not easy, but it's fun. Thanks for listening to the Hillsdale Dialogues, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. More episodes at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you find your audio. For more information about Hillsdale College, head to hillsdale.edu.